When the United States began building a new Ford-class supercarrier in the early 2010s, its goal was not only to demonstrate technological superiority, but also to define a new direction for the entire fleet. On the other hand, China, which had just begun to create its aircraft carrier fleet, quickly realized that naval power was no less important than a land army for a nation-state striving to achieve world leadership. The PRC has greatly accelerated the pace of construction, launching the third domestic aircraft carrier, Fujian. Will it be able to outperform its Ford-class overseas opponent, the USS John F. Kennedy? Or is a slow but measured pace still more important for the fleet than haste? Let's find out. China's aircraft carrier program has languished for decades due to a lack of strategic imperative. However, at least one person in China refused to let the idea of domestic aircraft carriers die. Clan leader Liu Huangang, who is often called the father of China's aircraft carrier or China's Mayhan. In 1982, after being promoted to plan commander, Liu commissioned a research institute in Shanghai to conduct research on the feasibility of carriers. China's purchase of the decommissioned Australian aircraft carrier HMAS Melbourne in 1985, allegedly for scrap, confirmed Beijing's growing interest in the aircraft carrier program. The ship was carefully studied by Chinese engineers and naval architects, and in the end it was decided to keep the flight deck and send the rest of the ship for scrap. In parallel, in the same year, Liu commissioned the Gongsao Naval Academy to initiate a training course for aircraft carrier commanders. Following the collapse of the USSR, maritime issues came to the forefront of Beijing's national security agenda by the mid-1990s. They gained three new neighbors in Central Asia by quickly recognizing these nation-states, resolving territorial disputes, and demilitarizing border areas. The growing importance of the Near Sea and PRC's dependence on the sea lines of communication, diverging beyond the first island chain, were highlighted by tensions in the South China Sea in 1995 the Taiwan Strait Crisis of 1995-96, and the rise of China in 1993 regarding petroleum net import by sea from the Middle East and Africa. In 1998, three Soviet aircraft carriers were purchased, Minsk and Variag, and in 2000, Kyiv for a total of $334 million. Interestingly enough, the buyer of Variag, the travel and entertainment agency Chang Lad, had several retired plan officers on its board of directors and although it was intended to turn the purchase ship into a floating casino in Macau, the waters around it turned out to be too shallow, and Changlot never did submit a single application for a gambling license to China for its floating casino. And the most interesting thing is that upon arriving in China in 2002, Variag moored at an impressive distance from Macau, all the way over in the northern port of Dalian. This once again confirmed Washington's fears that Beijing was involved in a serious debate about the feasibility of building or purchasing an aircraft carrier. In the 2010s, tensions arose in relations with the United States and China's neighbors and nearby seas, highlighting this growing importance of sea power for the PRC. Thus, in 2010, China accused the United States of interfering in the affairs of the South China Sea and then protested against planned military exercises between China and South Korea in the Yellow Sea. Tensions also rose in the East China Sea over the disputed Diaoyu Senkaku Islands, with Beijing claiming a 200-mile exclusive economic zone in those areas and stipulating that other countries could not operate military vessels or aircraft there without prior approval from China. Against the backdrop of an obvious evolution of strategic logic, the aircraft carrier Variag underwent its first sea trials in 2011, and just one year later was put into operation under the name Leoning, class type 001. However, its combat readiness was confirmed only in 2016, the same time that China announced the construction of a second aircraft carrier, but entirely according to its own design. It was named Shandong Type 002 class, it turned out that its construction had begun back in 2013, and launching took place in 2017. Like the first Chinese aircraft carrier, it used conventional steam turbines with diesel generators as propulsion and was a ski-jump aircraft carrier. The island structure of the new aircraft carrier was 10% smaller, and sponsons expanded in the aft part of the starboard side, thereby providing a little more space for another eight aircraft and helicopters. 
Granted, the total number of aircraft transported by Shandong turned out to be slightly lower than that of the Pioneer Liaoning, 30 units versus 40, but today all the attention of both the Chinese and foreign public is focused on the newest Fujian Type 003 class aircraft carrier, which according to experts, has become the largest and most advanced aircraft carrier ever built outside the United States. Its construction began in the winter of 2016, and by June of 2022, the Type 003-class ship, henceforth Christian Fujian, was launched. Although it's often described as a modified Kuznetsov-class aircraft carrier, it is in fact not only China's own design, but also the country's first aircraft carrier with the catapult-assisted takeoff but arrested recovery system. Its predecessors had preferred the good old short takeoff but arrested recovery. The Fujian's about 1,037 feet long, 249 feet wide, and has a total displacement of 80,000 to 85,000 tons, which is still short of the crown jewel of the U.S. Navy, the USS Ford, which measures 1,106 feet long, 206 feet wide, and displaces 100,000 tons. However, China hardly plans to stop there, just like the United States. But what definitely makes USS Ford and Fujian similar is the fact that they both use the most sophisticated aircraft launch technology, electromagnetic catapult, which no other country owning an aircraft carrier yet has. It was initially assumed that the Chinese aircraft carrier would receive steam catapults like its predecessors. However, in 2013, Plan Rear Admiral Yin Zuo stated that the future aircraft carrier will use electromagnetic technology. And the first prototypes of these catapults were noticed at a Chinese shipyard back in 2012. The flight deck is equipped with three such catapults and an inclined landing platform with an arresting device. By the way, the noticeable increase in the size of the Fujian in comparison with the same Shandong was justified precisely by the transition to electromagnetic catapults. Unlike American nuclear supercarriers, the propulsion of the ship is driven by steam turbines and diesel generators that are more modest by today's standards. And for efficient energy distribution, the ship received an integrated power system. On the weapons side, Fujian retains its combination of HQ-10 short-range surface-to-air missiles and 30mm multi-barrel close-in weapons systems, while its sensors and electronics include a new type of ASA radar on the superstructure of the island. But as we know, an aircraft carrier is only as useful as its aircraft. We're, of course, talking about the number of sorties that the ship can handle. In fact, the daily frequency of sorties may well be considered a rough measure of a vessel's overall firepower. The good news for China is that even the 50,000-ton Liaoning can maintain an efficiency of 50 sorties per day for nine days in a row, according to the Japanese Ministry of Defense. Considering that Fujian is a much more advanced model, this number can be almost doubled. The bad news is that even for the aging Nimitz-class carriers that the Ford class has replaced, the standard is 120 sorties per day for several weeks for a wing of 60 fixed-wing aircraft. And for emergency situations, this number reaches 240 flights per day. Ford-class aircraft carriers, according to various sources, due to their spacious flight decks and the presence of weapons elevators, can carry out a standard 160 sorties per day and 270 to 300 sorties during peak periods. Not to mention the fact that the United States still has more aircraft carriers than China. That is, in the event of a conflict between two superpowers, the PRC will be able to deploy up to 150 daily sorties on its aircraft carriers, while the U.S. Navy will deploy five to six of its 11 aircraft carriers to the Western Pacific Ocean, capable of carrying out more than 700 sorties per day. It's also worth remembering that all U.S. aircraft carriers can launch strike fighters at their full weight, which allows, for example, the U.S. Navy F-A-18EF Super Hornet to take off with 17 tons of weapons and fuel. At this weight, the F-A-18 can fly more than 400 miles with 8 tons of missiles and bombs under its wing. Liaoning and Shandong will be able to launch their Shenyang J-15 fighters from ramps on the bow and provided there's no stiff headwind, Chinese aircraft carriers will not be able to launch J-15s with a maximum weight of 17 tons, comparable to the F-A-18. In other words, even the unpredictability of weather conditions may quickly force China to launch its fighters with a reduced amount of weapons and fuel, and therefore with a shorter operating range, which will directly affect the prospects for victory in the conditions of intense conflicts.
The planned air wing aboard the new Fujian aircraft carrier will most likely be led by the Shenyang J-35 multi-role stealth fighter, accompanied by the Shenyang J-15 fighters and the airborne early warning and control Xi'an KJ-600 aircraft. It's also possible that Fujian could be used to land drones, which has long been a growing area of interest for the plan. Sea trials of the aircraft carrier were successfully completed in May 2024, and by September of that same year, the world media reported that all three Chinese aircraft carriers went to sea as a group for the first time. In recent years, the planned Navy has expanded its global presence, moving beyond regional waters more often and in greater numbers while continuing to deploy warships and logistic support vessels that provide the force with greater range. At least that's what the Pentagon said in a report published in December of 2024. Additionally, if we consider the number of fleets, the PRC has already overtaken the United States in the total number of ships. As of 2024, the Chinese Navy already has over 370 combat units, including aircraft carriers, destroyers, submarines, and support ships. With the prospect of increasing this figure to 420 by the end of 2025 and to 460 by 2030. The U.S. Navy has less than 300 ships, but with more impressive tonnage and technological content. And although the implementation of almost all the high-tech systems of the Ford class of aircraft carriers turned out to be a headache for the U.S. Navy, they successfully overcame their infantile illnesses and have almost completed work on equipping the second supercarrier, John F. Kennedy. Further plans include a third Enterprise vessel and a complete replacement of the Nimitz class by 2040. Meanwhile, China plans to use nuclear reactors in its aircraft carriers only with the future Type 004, the construction of which, according to rumors, started back in 2017. Many experts agree that while the United States should not definitely relax their pace of building new warships in order to stay ahead of China, America still has almost a century of operating aircraft carriers in dozens of theaters around the world. Simply put, there's a competition between experience and quantity. Which of these is more important in the event of war is a rather rhetorical question. But now it's time to tell us what you think. What characteristics of aircraft carriers do you consider the most important, and why? And if you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and hit that notification bell for more content like today's. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.